Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to what I think is day four of the talks program. I've almost lost count, but uh, it's great to see you all here. Uh, thanks for turning up for this fantastic panel of curators and culture makers. My name is Glenn Adamson. I'm the curatorial director for Design Miami this year and next. And this panel is about the craft legacy. So very briefly, the idea here is that we are all aware of the studio craft movement, American craft movement of the post-1945 period. Uh, and to some extent, that had international um, versions, especially in Europe, to some extent in Japan and elsewhere. And what we're thinking about here today is what the state of play is in the 21st century when it comes to crafts involvement in design, which is a big subject, which we'll get into, but also more specifically, now that the studio craft movement could be said to have come to an end, maybe we could debate that, but to the extent that it's now modulated into other keys, into the design avant-garde, among other formations, how do we think about the ongoing impact and resonance of the craft movement today? That's what we're talking about. Uh, fortunately, we have an absolutely stellar group to lead us through that uh, conversation. I really can't think of a better combination of voices, in fact. So first, uh, from my left, uh, we have Elisa Author, who's the chief curator at the Museum of Arts and Design. Uh, and then we have Angelique viscarondo Leboy and Kelly Riggs, who in addition to their other multifarious curatorial and writing projects, were the co-curators of are the co-curators of Objects USA 2024 at Arun Company Gallery. It's great to have our friends from Arun in, in that crowd here too. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of overlap between the sensational uh, work that they did in Objects USA 2024 and what you'll see here in Design Miami as well. So a lot of correspondence is there. Then we have Mariah Nielsen uh, from Blunk Space. Uh, the winner of Best Curio at Design Miami 2024. Congratulations, Mariah. <laughs> And Mariah will tell, say a little bit more about her father, J.B. Blunk, and how uh, she's forwarding his legacy today. So a kind of perfect case study in what we're talking about. And then we have Ella Story Lichtenstein from Austria. So the geographical outlier, but not the creative or spiritual outlier in any sense. So Ellis will again talk about her project. But we thought it would be great to have somebody with a cosmopolitan uh, in this case, European view of the question. Uh, and also, of course, your project at Schloss Hollenegg is a really great example of how craft and design can be integrated into one creative space. So what we're gonna do, uh, because Objects USA is in the air, having been obviously the, um, the prime spark behind Kelly and Angelique's project, but also such an important history, uh, such an important historical moment in the craft movement and the history of the Museum of Arts and Design itself, is to ask Elisa to start off by talking about that project uh, and some of its impact today. So Elisa. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, I love talking about Objects USA. It's a fascinating exhibition and the historical context is really interesting as well, but I think we might get to some of that later in the conversation. So I'm just gonna give the briefest um, of notes and description for you in case you're unfamiliar with the show. It was a very large, sprawling uh, group exhibition, a survey of the craft makers uh, around the country. Um, it, was, it included 500 objects, if you can imagine, 258 artists. And it was sponsored by S.C. Johnson and Company. Uh, it was co-curated by the gallerist, New York gallerist Lee Nordness and Paul Smith, who at the time was the director of the Museum of Contemporary Crafts, now the Museum of Arts and Design. The show opened in October of 1969 at the Smithsonian uh, Museum, the Renwick Museum, um, as it was called at the time, and traveled to MAD uh, in 1972, where it closed. But it, it circulated to something like 30 venues, which just seems like unimaginable <laughs> in today's uh, world. Uh, it was uh, a smash hit, uh, incredible positive reviews, with the exception of the review that was written for Craft Horizons, which was the leading craft magazine at the time, and we can talk about what that uh, response was all about. Um, it was geographically diverse. It certainly wasn't uh, racially diverse in ways that we talk about today, but you can't ignore that there was a conscious effort um, to include artists um, across the, the spectrum. I have some, um, hang on, I wanna just look at the 
stats here. I have notes. I should say, while you're looking for that, that the book itself is pretty widely available yeah. still because they printed so many copies and it's absolutely the Bible of the craft movement. So if you haven't had a chance to look at it, track down a copy and, and of course it was also the kind of um, template for the catalog for the new shows. Yeah, fascinating book. So the breakdown was 66% men, 34% women, so it was 86 women, um, 22 Asian American artists, six black artists, six indigenous artists, and two artists that today we would uh, categorize as or include within Latinx. Um, so it's the geographic uh, diversity is also quite interesting. Lee Nordness and Paul Smith traveled the country. They were looking to bring in the uh, sort of uh, older generation that had established itself alongside a wide variety of younger makers coming up in the world. So you had this amazing uh, kind of diversity of um, styles, of levels of skill, of forms of expression. It, it went from the applied to the abstract, really, really fascinating uh, sort of picture of what people were doing in craft mediums um, at this time. Right, so um, fast forwarding then, uh, I had the opportunity to work with the team at R and Company to create a kind of rebooted version of this show at the gallery in 2020. Um, and that was simply called Objects USA 2020. And now four years later, we've had this new version um, of what I think will now be a triennial, is that right? It'll be every three years going forwards. Um, so Kelly and Angelique, you curated the new version. And instead of categorizing it by material, which is how the original one was done, you decided to categorize it by provocative theme. So I wonder if you could explain a little bit about that and also um, what you discovered in the course of your research. I can start. Um, hi. Um, I think what happened, I mean, when you do a large scale um, survey exhibition, it's really difficult to figure out how everybody fits together and make it make sense. And I don't think we, you know, outwardly rejected sort of conventions that we rely on we definitely wanted to do something different and so I think when Angelique and I started um, moving people around we really um, found some things there things were emerging and the archetypes the seven archetypes of objecthood sort of emerged based on what we were seeing in the work um, and some of the work um, it's important to talk about material it's really vital to understanding certain pieces and certain approaches, but for other people that's not true at all, and so we wanted to create groupings that held everybody um, uniquely, and it was more about like the approach and the why of making versus the what. We like to say that a lot. I just feel like she said <laughs> it. <laughs> you guys must have that problem a lot. <laughs> Can you give an example of some of the um, themes that you used? Yeah, of course. Um, so we came up with seven archetypes. It's a spectrum so basically it's really more of a cycle but the way that it works out in the book and in the exhibition it has some more of a linear feeling and a lot of the artists and designers fall in in between so they can kind of fall between two categories but we started with truth sayers we go to beta testers and doomsdayers insiders mediators code breakers and win with keepers and i know that just kind of saying these words don't, they don't really mean anything um Right now, um, I really encourage you to take a look at the catalog or if you're still able to make it to the show um, in New York, it's open through January 10th, um, you'll, it will make a lot more sense. I think that um, if you compare those groupings to clay, metal, plastic, that's how the original project was categorized. And then the 2020 version, um, half of the roster was historical, so people from the original project and half of um, the group was contemporary. And so we were like, let's let's really make a time capsule. Um, it, it was it's a lot of emerging people. We decided early on no deceased artists, and our only real criteria was um, you have to be actively making in the United States of America. So we have people in their 20s, we have people in their 80s, um, and we tried to be as diverse with, as possible with obviously the roster, but materiality. So um, we, ha we have something of everything, um, which we're really proud of. I think uh, the categories are active, they're generative, and I think it's also reflective of just kind of the art world overall, which maybe it's what we're going to talk more about. Yeah. Um, I think it's just reflective of just a sort of more narrative-driven approach as opposed to like material-based or object-based um, or, you know, format-based uh, mode of approaching curatorial work. So yeah, I think we were talking about thinking about storytelling, which 
it's just kind of happening overall. And yeah. it's also like, I don't think we set off to contribute to the way we discuss design or like redefining things. Um, if that happens, that's great. But it's also, I mean, it contributes to academia or um, scholarship in one way. But then if you're coming off of the street and you don't know anything about design, and you're like, well, what's the doomsday room? So there's, you really can take something with you regardless of how much you know about what you're looking at, which I think is important in curating in general. So. Yeah, it's a kind of curatorial lens which brings things into focus, essentially, rather than a new typology uh, or classification system that insists on a kind of canonical right. or representative um, systematicity. And I think that's interesting in and of itself that now we curate, we, you guys in this case, curate in that more permissive, suggestive, as I say, provocative way rather than um, insisting on some kind of absolute descriptive completion. So it's very anti canonical in that way, um, which is interesting because the original Objects USA did become the canon. Yeah, tried to be completist in right. some way. Exactly. Okay, Mariah, exhibit A. <laughs> JB Blunk was, of course, in Objects USA. Yeah. Um, and was one of the breakout stars of that show, probably. Um, yeah, he was my, my, fa my father. Uh, my father was on the cover of TV Guide, thanks to Objects USA, and he was featured in the film with these hands, which is an incredible short film that was made as part of the exhibition. It featured Peter Volkus and a number of other um, craftspeople, and uh, that really catapulted my father into this next level of fame and notoriety. But the TV Guide cover, amazingly, we don't even have a copy in our archive. Oh, right. I don't know how that happened. So if anyone has a copy or knows of where to get one, I've been trolling eBay, but let me know. I feel like Florida <laughs> is a really good place to look for that somehow. <laughs> exactly. but, um, <laughs> but So Mariah, can you say yeah. a little bit about what you're doing at Blunk Space to extend his legacy? Yeah, it's, it's actually a really, um, I'd say, easy segue from what you were just talking about to what I'm trying to do with my father's estate, which isn't focused on uh, the materials he worked with necessarily, but more about his process of, of making and his approach to the creative um, process and, and a kind of um, spirit. Uh, the, the artists that I've been exhibiting at a gallery that I started Lung Space three years ago in Point Ray Station are connected to my father, but not in the most direct ways. Um, Ryo Kobayashi, for example, who's with us in the back room wearing the messy jersey, um, he was invited to my father's house this year and made a series of furniture inspired by very specific architectural features in the Blanc house, a house that my father built by hand in the late 1950s using all salvage materials. And so I would say Ryo's work is inspired by JB and this home he created in my father's collection, but not his work, Rio's work, is not derivative. It's not trying to copy or emulate in some sort of direct way what my father made. So that kind of more expansive approach to curating and um, a focus more on the process and the general kind of um, yeah theology around the way that my father lived and worked is what I'm trying to nurture. And I've been managing my father's estate since 2007. He died in th 2002 and left a collection fairly small compared to estates like the Calder or the Judd Foundation, for example. But I think that small scale has allowed me to be very nimble and very creative and very resourceful. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it's actually keeping it really interesting and fun, which is very important. And Blunk Space is a gallery, we should be clear. Yeah, so it's, it's a not gallery. just a pop-up, yeah. Yeah, it's a project space, it's a gallery. We have um, about four exhibitions a year that are always presenting work made by artists and designers who spend time at the Blanc House. So we invite the artists to spend anywhere from two weeks to a month living and working in my father's home and studio. And then that work that they create on site, we exhibit at the gallery. So this is a way of expanding my father's legacy, really bringing life and energy into it in, um, like I said, a more expansive way. So I'm not just exhibiting my father's work. I'm not just strictly talking about what he did. I'm, t I'm creating attempting to create a series of conversations and really focus on the kind of ripple effect out from the work that my father made. Great, okay, thank you. And so uh, last but not least, Alice Story Lichtenstein. So you're uh, coming to us from Schloss Hollenig for Design in Austria. Um, what's interesting is that actually your exhibition projects have been organized by material, but you explore that in a very different way than we see in Objects USA, so there's a different kind of connection. So here, uh, before you start letting us know what you think about the American craft movement, maybe you could just explain a little bit about Schloss Hollenegg, how it started, what you do there. So in a way, it's quite similar to what you're doing. So it's a, uh, it's a castle in Austria 
and it spans 800 years of uh, history of art and crafts and architecture. And uh, we moved uh, full time there in 2014, and the idea was like, okay, we need to do something with the place, which is just more than, you know, raise our kids. And um, so we started with residencies in the summer and with an exhibition program, which happens every year in May. And actually, we're coming up to the 10 years anniversary, which is quite exciting. And yeah, as you say, the last, the first five years, they were more thematic, so it was broader themes. But the last five years, we have been concentrating on material. Um, what, is, what is the idea about the place is inviting contemporary emerging designers to really engage with the history of the place. So uh, there's lots of castles in Europe. Um, most of them are pretty empty and uh, they've been like, kind of been, you know, uh, kind of changed into hotels or venues. And what, what is quite unique about Schloss Solenig is that every room is packed. And some of the things are precious. Some of them are just kind of like, you know, everyday objects that the generations before ours kind of just left behind. So even if it's like a little bit dusty and, and run down, it still feels very much like a place where people have always been living. And, and I think that's what it's something that is quite unique as an exhibition space because the, you know, we, we don't have, uh, you know, safety glass, and we don't have kind of like distances. People just walk through the rooms. Of course, they're not touching everything, but they really have the feeling, okay, so someone was sitting here and this object could live here forever. And what's great about, I mean, this is a perfect example. We have two Chinese vases and in the middle of it, it's a um, 3D printed ceramic by a contemporary um, German artist. So it's kind of like really fitting in the contemporary with with the old and then you kind of realize that it's it's all the same you know call it design call it art call it applied arts it's just creative input and there's just references going back centuries so okay so that's the perfect segue to the big question which is what do these different concepts have to do with one another so i'm going to just take us take it for granted that we all and probably you agree that craft design and art are not distinct categories with hard lines drawn between them, but rather more like conceptual fields of reference that we still use to navigate, even though they seem to some extent historical, right? So that, that seems to be the, pretty much agreed to be the state of play. And I will say that although all the debates rightly have swirled around the shift of the name American Craft Museum to Museum of Arts and Design, um, arguably not the best name for a museum in the world, but on, on the other hand, adopting that very open phrase was very emblematic of its moment of an embrace of cross-disciplinarity, to give it some credit. So, Elisa, I don't, I don't know if you mind starting here, but what I want to do is then in any order, just people jump in as you like, what do you actually think the ongoing resonance of the craft movement is today in design? Where do you see it? Hmm. I think I'm going to speak as a historian and a, a, a curator. Like, I used to think of Objects USA as the most pivotal show for the field that no one ever heard of, right? Um, but now it's not unusual for me to talk to artists who know a lot about it and are very influenced by this particular historic moment. And that's just a, a new conversation that I think fuels a lot of new work. So either an honoring of um, a particular look or style, an honoring of a way of working, but then tweaking that. It, it's been a catalyst in ways that I didn't expect. Let me just put it that way. So for me, it's there. Um, I don't know how to, beyond, beyond saying it's fueling a lot of the contemporary work that I see, especially in the areas of fiber, um, my encounters with artists who I'm visiting in their studios, that seems new to me and a kind of legacy. Yeah, just to stay with you for a second, Lisa, because you're a fiber um, aficionado and expert, uh, it's absolutely astonishing to me how many mega fiber shows there have been this year. Yeah. So yeah. just a brief list, Olga de Amaral mm -hmm. at, the, um, at the Cartier Foundation. Mm -hmm. You have Barbara Chase Reboot in eight museums across Paris. Mm -hmm. You have Lenore Tani and uh, Toshiko Takezu, the ceramic artist, and Alison Jakes. Basically, the Venice Biennale had a massive textile show hiding inside it. Mm -hmm. You had the Woven History show at yeah. the National Gallery of Art by Lynn Cook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm probably forgetting textiles quite a bit. Textiles yeah. coming up at Schloss Hollenegg. Yeah. Textiles at Schloss Hollenegg, unravel at the Barbican. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. 
And right. a lot of so, those are motivated by a look at history, right? Like a look back to this moment and be, and, and like a rediscovery, let's say. Um, it's, it's as if the audience for this work, it's never been stronger. It, it's since the, from the point when these objects were originally made. It's very right. weird the way it's come back. Despite the fact, of course, that fiber art was almost the quintessence of a despised art phenomenon. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. right. Yeah. So, um, Angela, go for it. Yeah. Because it was made by women. That's why. Um, um, I I think we're in like a transitional moment almost. I, like you like you said, those categories are super blurred, and I think more than ever now. Um, I, in my experience, I encounter equally artists who are completely aware of the history and then artists who are not aware of the history at all. They just simply chose to work with, let's say, clay. Um, I don't think, not all artists working in ceramics are necessarily conscious of like the great history that comes from the studio craft movement. Um, I do think that we are working to make that um, information more readily available to everybody. Personally, when I'm curating, like, yes, I'm thinking of narrative and storytelling, but context is really important to me. And like, I don't ever want to forget like that there's like the, that all these mediums have have baggage in a sense um, that just by picking a very specific medium, you're carrying that history forward, whether you're conscious of or not. Yes, yeah, yeah. Can you say a little bit more about the first thing you said, which is that, that these media, and in general, the craft movement was a domain for female creativity? Yeah. So we heard the statistics, Objects USA was only one, only one third women, but yeah. by the standards of the time, that was obviously yeah. very, very unusual. Yeah. So what do you think about the gender access here? Yeah, um, I, I just worked on a book. Uh, it's called New, Wom New Women's Work. I interviewed 38 women identifying or non-binary artists who are actively engaging with a medium or a craft technique that historically or culturally has been considered women's work. And I think a lot of what craft was originally, like I think we have like craft with a capital C, thinking of the pseudo craft movement, but craft has been a part of humanity forever um, and I think that was mostly it was women and people of color and just civilizations all around the world that were engaging with craft practices that then became professionalized in a different way through the studio craft movement um, and I think because of these sort of marginalization that was happening because women are artists artists of color are working as materials I think that also contributed to like the hierarchies that were built over time that put craft to the side, even though it was a very different demographic carrying it forth in the yeah. pseudo craft movement. Can I push on that point for yeah. a second? This is something I've thought about yeah. um, myself and never come to a really strong conclusion about. Yeah. So let's assume that craft was invented as a weaponized term to marginalize people, which I, to me that's not, again, debatable. You look at the history of the 18th and 19th century basically things that were elevated, so-called, as art, were the intellectual property of white European men and craft was the creativity of everyone else, right? That's where the word comes from in its modern usage. Do you think it's legitimate to then, given that history, use the word craft as a term of empowerment? I mean, it is to me. Um, I, I, I'm very proudly a craft historian and curator and like, I don't, I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not, I'm, I'm not backing out from it. Clearly at some point, it was a very challenging word and that's how we ended up with MAD or, you know, so many schools dropped it. Um, and there's like that famous article of like, like the making it like a bad word. Um, I do think there's reclamation that can happen and that should happen with it. Same thing with women's work, right? Like it was used respectively at many points in time, but like, I'm proud, like I would be proud to say like I do women's work and I'm proud that I do craft. Like it's, I think there is a lot of power in reclaiming that. And that's taken a while to happen, right? Like the embrace of the craft shame that uh, was long associated with it. Um, and you know Mad's collection as well as I do. Angelique, uh, we're, we used to be colleagues at the museum and there's it's no surprise that you have 
uh, like 50% of the artists in the collection are female, right? Because craft was a term of exclusion and this was the only place really, the, the, the place where they could uh, show, the place where they could be part of a community and be collected by an institution, a fine art institution. Right, and arguably if we were going to be critical about the craft movement on one score, it would probably be that it was not inclusive enough of non-white makers. Absolutely, yeah. Right, who were thought to be vernacular or folk or something else, so there's right. these levels of, of marginalization. Outsider art. Outsider yeah. art, exactly, yeah. Um, Kelly, Maya, Alice, what would you like to weigh in on this? I can weigh in a little bit. I went to art school. I think I my bubble is like I'm around artists all the time. I'm also not a historian. I'll leave that to everybody else. Um, so I think, but the, but the craft like illegitimacy of the, the word itself is very real. And I've done like a total 180. Um, I, I went to RISD for jewelry and I was like, I don't know, not ashamed of it or something, but the, the like the indoctrination is real that it's like less valid or um, illegitimate or whatever. And now I can, I feel like completely differently. And now that I've become a curator and I'm, when I look for things, I'm like, oh, it has to be there. Um, or it has to be like completely subverted, but it's all, for me, it always has to be there. Um, and I think that's really beautiful and because amazing. Because it generates value or? I don't know. I think it's because I, what, I know what it means to make something from start to finish. And I know the, the labor involved and I know the time that's involved. And then I just like, I'm obsessed with people who feel called to like go in a room and make something and like futz with things and take what they have around them or, or learn a, a craft or whatever. And like, that's how they want to spend their time. I think that's what it is for me. So when I, and we were talking about weaving, I think why weaving is so hot right now is because you, it's a transparent object. You can see literally how it's come together and there's something like universal um, and real about that people can understand yeah, that whether the, they can say that or not they understand and the, it. the time is visible yeah. I feel like with the textile especially you get a sense of how much time it took to weave or thread or move that yarn across or through something but the time is palpable the time it took yeah. to make it with your hands or someone's hands temporality and I think your word transparency Kelly is very yeah. interesting too I was going to ask you about a related term Mariah which is integrity mm -hmm. because if I've ever met anybody who had integrity and self-reliance it was your father yeah and Agreed. I wonder whether you would agree that one reason that craft has this kind of uh, imaginative power for the art and design world now is because of that yeah, I, I think I think that's correct. Um, my father made everything himself. He had one assistant for 25 years and another for about four years, and those were the only people that ever helped him. Um, he was determined to connect with the material and the tools he was using, and that relationship and the time it took to carve stone or make jewelry or paint a painting or carve a table was important to him and it was it was part of the energy that the final piece would exude and you can feel that i think you can feel it in our booth because everything in that booth was made by hand adam pogue stitched every single thread and the cushion and the hanging screen we have alana crafted all of the jewelry and rio made i don't know how the hell he did it in two weeks but he made the pieces of furniture there in two weeks working 14 hour days in jb's wood shop it was insane so that, that, that connection to the material, the tools, the time, all of that, I think, is, uh, is palpable from the work. Rhea's back there thinking, don't tell them it only took two weeks. I know. <laughs> we were joking about that. We're like, maybe we need to tell people it took seven and a half months. <laughs> exactly. Two years. Exactly. Two years of slow crafting yeah, away. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think that's really crucial because it seems to me that the advantage of 21st century culture, if I can summarize broad, very, very broadly, uh, generalize, uh, is connectivity, but obviously the problem with connectivity is that it disperses energy and it seems to make it difficult to even allocate responsibility or accountability. And craft, of course, is pushing in the exact opposite direction. It's focusing, it's um, located both in the body and in a place in the material. So that seems like an ethic still, and maybe an ethic that we were increasingly detached from, literally losing touch with, right? And these are conventional arguments, but I think they're also very powerful and extremely relevant to what we see in the design 
context, which we'll get to in a second. But Alice, I wanted to ask you to give us a little bit more of a European angle on this, because obviously the design well, craft I was actually going line. to give a Japanese <laughs> Even better. view to this, okay. because nice. it just reminds me, like um, in, in Japan, the idea of crafts and arts just does not exist. So, you know, you have a beautiful piece of pottery and that's art, or you have, you know, a, a kind of uh, lacquered box and that's art. So they, they don't have this very kind of like, distinction which i think a lot comes uh, also from just the the necessity of uh you know studying the different uh techniques and and you know for a kind of idealized view of like putting everything in the right in the right compartment so that you can study it better so that you can explain it better yeah sell but it better sell it better as well um so a lot of it actually comes from from you know an academic uh perspective i think and then it kind of a bit wrong but I think it's always I always think back to Japan and I just always think okay it doesn't matter you know as long as it's made with this kind of like uh, you know with this time definitely and with like a kind of tradition technique but then there's always some kind of innovative element to it and I think that's just it's just nice to just remember okay this is not craft this all of it is art you know and then and then we just define it more specifically because we need to have you know, the different words to communicate mm -hmm. where we want to place it. Or so. perhaps we could say all of it is creativity to be yeah. a little less charged yeah. about it. So, Alice, what about the, as I do want to get the European context in yeah. play here too, <laughs> because one way that I might look at it is that in Europe you have the concept of an artisan class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there, just to bring that other dimension of social structure in, and I, it feels like that's a very different way that things are organized there than they are at least in the American imagination. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think I think uh, in in a way there's there's much I don't know maybe it's just more in the kind of technique and learning how to do to do the task. So I think in in that sense, I think that maybe in Europe there's there's still very strong this idea of of knowing how to do things and the craftsman is is something that that we all kind of very much value. So there's you know the handmade and and. I think that's something that maybe it's still very strong in Europe and maybe there was a time when it kind of went down a little bit because, you know, great hype on doing everything technologically, but it's still something which is very, very important. And of course, coming from Italy, you know, everything has to be handcrafted. And I think even if it's, even if we're not talking about art because we're talking about products, I think that's something that people are aware, you know, the, the extra value of putting the time in and having been made by hand. Yeah, right. and I think that's something that, that you know, we were talking about Florence. I think that's something that is you yeah. know, very strong. Yeah, you do I, your own colors. There. You do your own. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You no, do your own right. colors. You do your own uh, clay. You do you do everything yourself. Yeah, and I think that's that's what brings uh, this this kind of knowledge and, and know how. Yeah. I have a it's sort of an opposite anecdote. I have a friend. He's Roman, and he's a he's sort of a conceptual artist. And I remember him him telling me that he felt really illegitimate because he felt like he didn't know how to make enough things. He didn't have like um, the material knowledge that he should have. Um, and so it's, it's, it's kind of the opposite in Italy. It's still really mm -hmm. slow and you're sp still supposed to do um, everything yourself. And it's very rich and it's very accessible actually, like this artisanal sort of, I mean, maybe I'm just in the bubble again, but it's sort of everywhere um, to see. It's, it's much more part of like every day for people to see someone like, turning bronze or upholstering a chair or making jewelry or making shoes. I mean, it's also really linked with um, yeah. fashion or not fashion, but clothing and tailoring, that kind of thing. So right. it's sort of stuck there in a really lovely way. And it, it is disappearing, but it's, it's, it's way more embedded in regular culture than it is here for sure. But I think, I think it, it, in, in some ways it's disappearing, but I think there's also a lot of hopefulness that it yeah. will survive. What, what we've been working uh, over the last two, three years, with um, especially in the last exhibition, the Woodland exhibition, was really combining this uh, craft aspect and this kind of handwork aspect with the technology. And I think that's where, you know, the future is not just, oh, we need just a robot. We need this interaction between the man and the robot. And then things come out which are like, wow, you know, and where did your hand finish and where did the robot hand finish? And I think that's a really, really exciting uh, development for for craft and for arts um, because because there's there's like a seamlessness at some point yeah there's there's yeah. a picture of a table which is half of it is done by the robot and designed on the computer and half of it it's kind of like real you know 
sweat. Uh, you know, and I think that's something which is also, um, it's probably like, we, we can, you know, 10 years time, so it'll, 10 years time, it'll be really interesting to see how it, that is seamless is developing yeah. and where it's going to take us. This is us. probably a good moment to mention that at two o'clock, we have a panel discussion about artificial intelligence and design, which is approaching the same question from the opposite angle. So do come back for that, um, hosted by MIT with us. But um, let me ask a more specific question, which is where you see craft here in, in this tent, because you've all spent a lot of time at the fair. And how do you see it performing? Are there specific examples, or do you get a general vibe of this as a craft show, like hiding inside a design fair? I mean, it's there. It's really polished, uh, though. Um, and the format for me is crazy. Like everything's for sale. And so you're like, you have to look at things in a different way. And so um, the statements that are being made are, are like more holistic, but coming from a singular source, it's, it's very, it's less about the individual, just like optically. So it's hard to sort of find it for me. Not, that's not a, a criticism, but. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if there's also, um, th there's a lot of craft, but it's not necessarily by the author of the work. Right. So there's a lot of fabricated material. Right. I don't know whether anyone would want to speak to that, but what do other people think in terms of where craft well, is like here? Carl Fritsch's work really stands out to me immediately. I don't know if you visited the booth. I'm forgetting the name Ornamentum. of it. Ornamentum. Yeah, Ornamentum. But Carl Fritsch is an um, incredible artist who uh, typically makes jewelry rings, and the display in the booth is, I don't know how many rings, maybe 100 or more uh, lined up in a row. But Carl is such an artist, and yet it's also probably the most distilled example of craft, something that is truly handmade in a very kind of rough, raw way. But yet his level of skill is, I think, extremely high. I adore his work, so maybe this is a slightly biased comment, but that really strikes me as, as a, a sort of key example of It's a perfect example, this. too, because it's also the inventiveness and obviously yeah. his ability to make yeah. and create that kind of chain of associations is literally then presented in an exhibition context. Yeah, and here. all these iterations. Yeah, great yeah, example. It's beautiful. Yeah, um, but of course, a very small scale, so hard to do that with chairs, right? And so that's where the, these other factors come in when it comes to the polish that you're describing, Kelly. Elisa, there is a polish. I, I would agree with Kelly on that, but I still think there's a level of ingenuity um, that comes straight out of something, or that you could find in. Objects USA very easily. And in fact, that was one thing that critics constantly went to. It's a little bit related to uh, your father's work, right? There's some sort of integrity there that was noticed <clears throat> by the critics and that they found that very um, affirming of sort of like human ingenuity or ability to create. Um, and I still see that here. There's all kinds of, of innovative applications. Um, beautiful work. Uh, it's, when you look through the catalog for Objects USA, it can feel scrappy. I think that's the context of the time. I don't see that here, um, but I do see a, there's definitely a level of expressiveness in ceramics um, that I think comes through and that reminds me of a lot of the experimental work from this period. And that's sort of a trend right now, don't you think, Angelique? Um. Yes, I, sorry, I was gonna say, my looking around, um, I see craft in everything. I just think that perhaps um, things maybe in the design world feel a little colder, a little less feeling in a way. Like I think that like if I encounter craft maybe at one of the other fairs, there's gonna be more of a story or sentimental quality to the work that I will likely connect to better. Um, yeah, that's, that's that's interesting. Uh, let me follow up on yeah. that. For, let me just say parenthetically that one thing I would observe is that there are a few galleries that probably would have been called craft galleries in the 1990s. So I'm thinking here about Hostler Burroughs, Sarah Myers Kauf, yeah. Ornamentum and Jewelry would be a good example of that. And then you have other galleries like Art and Company with Roberto Lugo, like leading with a potter, right? Or you know Friedman Benda with Javier Sinozian with these kind of mosaic pieces. Um, so there's obviously a lot of crossover and things that would easily have passed as part of the craft movement back in the day. 
Oh, sorry, Kelly. Oh, no, I'm saying? just, I'm forgetting his name, but um, at the Future Perfect, that giant metal wall, it's all like hand reposé. Yeah, um, exactly, that's like, from India. That yeah. is it. I mean, yeah, that's absolutely. it. Absolutely. So, so um, but you, you just raised an interesting point, which is that if you go across the street, just to get out of the design context and into the art context for a moment, we also have this other version of craft that's being propagated, which I've called sloppy craft, but you could also see it as sentimental, intentionally naive, almost conspicuously de-skilled, nice which seems to me the... the so um, I, sometimes you just go over and you say, well, actually, if that was in the design, that wouldn't be good enough. Right. It's like, this is not well made. That's and right. And it's kind of like, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's obviously purposefully done that way. And it, the internet, the, ah, sorry, intentionality is very, very different. But it's just, it's always kind of like fun for me to go there and say, wow, that wouldn't go. And, uh, and it's yeah. kind of like, um, well, maybe, maybe it's just, we've got very different parameters, what we expect to find here. But I think that's about demonstrating humanity. Right. Like it's, a, it's evidence that a human made this, that a real person made this. And I think that's, that's why I'm drawn to it. Like, like it's not a perfect image and it's not, because I also feel like to an extent, if something is too perfect, it could be made maybe by other people or by other tools. And it's, it's a signature to an extent, like right. being able, like making the decision of like, I'm not gonna resolve this corner yeah. in this like, felting or in this weaving, right? I'm, I'm making this choice and you can like feel the, the thinking happening and whatever um, emotions were going on in the making um, as opposed to like a very perfect thing. Um, Although I, I kind of want to insist on an, that as not being an either or because I think about yeah. JB's work and his capability was just prodigious across all of these different materials and yet that his work always had that in spades. So Yeah, and interestingly, my father's work is being exhibited at Art Basel and Design Miami Basel. So Kasman represents the estate, Blum represents the estate. Kasman has a few of my father's paintings that are artworks painted on driftwood. And is that art, fine art, and not craft okay. design? I mean, it's, I love that yes. slippage, and I love that the estate works with blue chip fine art galleries, fine art galleries, and... Can I ask also, another question about yeah. that then? Because, and this is a great one for you, Elisa. Okay. Um, so... It also seems to me, and I'm conscious of always also being somewhat involved in this process, that some artists like Toshiko Takezu, Lenore Tani, um, Olga Damro, who I mentioned before, Peter Volkus, your father, have been extracted from the studio craft context and are now being made into blue chip artists by galleries. But obviously that's a tiny percentile of the original craft movement, which is of course much more democratic and inclusive. And I wonder how you view that process. Do you think it's just a necessary Darwinian process of evolution through competition or what? It's such an interesting question. Um, first of all, it's partly like market driven, right? Like suddenly there's a market for this. Yeah, it depends on- you say on, arbitrary? I don't it, think it's it, arbitrary. Well, I don't. It's just I think it's it very selective. who decides. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, that's what I meant. Yeah. Um, it's whoever decides to like, I'm gonna champion this person and then I'm gonna bring them out yes, to the market. Yes, but it's not gonna work with everyone. Yeah. It's still not gonna work with everyone. And it's because you have different audiences and they bring different tastes, like actual tastes for certain kind of working of materials or um, a sensibility, intentionality that can be marketed, right, to different audiences. So you could market to this audience and the one that's maybe across the street. Yeah, the storytelling is such a big yeah. part of it also. What's the story True. behind this person? How can we as a, as a gallery share the story? How can we market that story? Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it is interesting who gets selected. Um, and that's happening more and more right now. So you can actually watch it in real time. Um, and it's hap been happening with, the, with fiber artists for uh, longer, I think, than... I feel Ceramicist. like Ruth Asawa was really the first one, yeah. David Swerner taking up Ruth Asawa and just saying, right. yes, and I, how she's Let's just say I'm never really surprised at the choices when they okay. get picked up and marketed You're to not. a broader audience. No, because okay. I, I can see that. I can totally see why you would have like an audience that maybe is coming out of uh, sort of the center of the art world, the conventional art world, and can buy that. Like, yeah, I, I can see that. I understand it. I can relate to it tends to be a lot of abstract work, mm -hmm. um, at least when it comes to fiber. 
So it makes sense to me. I guess the other thing I was going to say about these markets um, is that you know when you talk about issues of skill and virtuosity, perfection, refinement, like those have historically also been terms that are used to exclude people from the fine art world. And so um, it's I, I really try to be very conscious of that um, when I'm looking to uh, like if someone asks me something about some uh, a work that they think of as like too precious or too refined, I have to ask them like, okay, where is that coming from? Because there's different ways of working with material and different value systems for working with that material. And it might not, refinement or perfection might not be a gold standard in what we think of as the contemporary art world, but in certain worlds, it could be fiber, it could be glass, it could be ceramics, it's very, very important to your sort of value and prestige within those worlds and therefore the markets that you're reaching out to. So you have to be flexible and just always remember that those were terms of exclusion historically yeah. um, and why you wouldn't find maybe many of the artists here across the street or the fact that you have two different fairs even, right? right that cater to these different tastes and expectations on how you're gonna uh, work with materials or express your level of mastery. And just as an aside, it is striking to me that two media that lend themselves particularly well to technical precision and particularly poor, poorly to imprecision, which are metal and glass, are the ones yeah. that have been least completely in, absorbed into the fine art establishment, yeah. which is interesting. Yeah. So much like melty metal stuff, like just yeah. like metal, <laughs> melty metal on the wall, like it's everywhere. Like, gloop, like gloopy ceramics, it's right? Gloopy, yeah, and shaggy the, fiber. Mm, We've seen it. Uh, but okay, let me, so we can get some <laughs> questions. I just want to do very, very quick um, blue sky thinking uh, in honor of the fair theme. Where do you see this going? So, if you're imagining what Design Miami might be like or Art Miami, wherever you want to ground your response, what do you think will happen next in terms of the relationship between craft and these other conceptions of creativity? Anyone want to take that on? I'm super hopeful. I think they'll merge more and more. I think that as we kind of like. Uh, you know, fight for more inclusion and more diversity. And, you know, I think, as I say, I, I really truly believe that these words are used mainly because we want to have a kind of like intellectual discussion or a kind of like historical perspective. But I think, I think they are very old fashioned. And I think, I think I'm hopeful that they'll mix more and more and more and uh, we'll still use those words to kind of like navigate, but I think that there'll be a lot more new expressions coming in and I think we'll see them much more together. And um, I was in Manchester in the summer and I was blown away by the Museum of Art in Manchester because they have, there's no time uh, organization, it's only thematic and they have design objects, everyday objects, they have applied arts and fine art. Uh, put together in the same room with comparison of contemporary design with traditional crafts, explaining, you know, uh, colonialism, post-colonialism, pre-Raphaelites. And, and it's just, it's a small museum and it's for the layman and it's so well explained. And, and I thought, this is what we are, I mean, this is definitely what I'm working towards. Yeah, and I think a lot of us, that's, that's I think that's a really good um, direction to be moving into. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, yeah, mix it up, uh, more of the same. I think the, you know, the machine and the design and craft process is here, but I think there's also, there's no denying that, and there's a very particular style and type of work that's the result of all of that technology, which I think is, is a type of aesthetic that people are drawn to. Um, but then there's also the work that's purely made and strictly made by hand, like Carl's work or Rio's work. Um, and I think a combination of those two is, it's real. It's, it's where we are at this point in time. Mm -hmm. So I don't think one is necessarily better than the other, but I think having conversations between all of these different ways of making and the materials uh, is, is important. And I think it's what we should continue to present and champion. Okay, great. Kelly? I mean, agree. <laughs> um, it's sort of what we did with objects. I mean, you know, you were, talking earlier about this, um, the man versus the machine. I mean, we have a category for that. Um, there's a lot of stuff in our show that's made by one person from start to finish, like in the old way. We have a, we have a group for that too. And so I think maybe from a curatorial perspective, we can be more sensitive or be more generous or give our audience like um, the benefit of the doubt that 
these sort of things are um, things that distinguish practice um, are for everybody to understand a little bit better. Um, and whether that means you know craft or design will be mixed up with art, I think that's cool. My first reaction when I started noticing this, there was like a Venice Biennale I was at, and I was just like, wait a second, there's craft everywhere. And my, and my first reaction was like, how dare they? And then it's like, <laughs> oh, actually, isn't this what we want? Um, so I think the more we mix it up, but in a, in a thoughtful way, I, I, the better. So I look forward to that as yeah, well. Yeah, collections like the Barnes collection immediately comes to mind. I yeah. love those collections that are showcasing art, craft, design in a home all together in a space. And I think that's why so many people have been drawn to these artists' homes or designer homes. So many books about them, object and thing taking place in these historical homes. Yeah. But that type of mixing, I mean, doesn't it really come down to the way we live with the work at the end right. of the day? It's like That is a great point because, of course, what we're really talking about is a return to the way it always was before the 20th century, right? Where this is the historical norm is reasserting itself. Yeah, Angelique? Um, I agree. I think we need we are we are moving towards uh, a more interdisciplinary way of showcasing art, including again, including with quote unquote fine art and then craft and design all together because artists and designers are often thinking about the same things. They're just producing a, a, an object at the end of the day that looks different, right? Or they pick different materials. but so often there's such a deep connection with the like motivation for wh why they're making things and so we can we can create these environments that have very like rich textures and layers of different approaches to the same theme the same thought and so i think we're moving more and more towards that I think that's a really great way of putting it, that we're thinking about a three-dimensional experience instead of a two-dimensional one. So instead of like a chart with everything in its spot, you're thinking about this layered spatial exploration zone. That's a really great way of visualizing it, I think. Lisa? Yeah, now that I've listened to everybody, um, I'm like, well, why don't they just all move over here? And the, over there, you just call that the fair of wall art. And over here, it's everything else. I like that a because lot. this like, is more yeah. interesting on some level um, in the way that it is three dimensional, right? But we need stuff on the wall, too. I know, I know. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. But um, I do think, and Angelique, I'd also agree with you, I think it's largely driven by artists. Um, right, this this kind of blending of, uh, or the ability to move back and forth between these categories. But there's also just a lot of investment in these different <laughs> markets. Like, I think you'd, it would be very difficult, um, or I, I would be surprised to see them um, completely merge, uh, because there's reasons why you might want something that's called Design Miami versus something that should have a title Context. that's, yeah, yeah, you know, um, it and shouldn't be the generic across the street, like this is art, this is design, but And by the way, it is contractual. So yeah. the galleries here are not allowed to show paintings, yes, for example, exactly. or pure sculpture, and galleries over there are, are very, very strongly discouraged. I don't know if they're allowed, but they're very strongly discouraged from showing design. Yeah, I don't think they're allowed. It's a, so, le it's you a know, legal matter. Those yeah. are markets. It's hard. That's finance. That's yeah. that's investment. It's going to be hard to um, uh, you know, really erase that, but it is... It, they're butting up against what artists are doing. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I mean, I guess j just to say one little bit from my own point of view, having been curatorial director of this fair now and having a keener appreciation of it than I used to, I don't think I would want to see this fair just absorbed and swallowed into the great yeah. behemoth over there. I think it has something special and warm. I, and I totally agree with community, you. There's community, so we also have to bear that in mind as we're thinking about the mixology as being great. There's also something about the specificity that's great. I would compare it in some ways to the dynamics of um, ethnicity or geography or gender where the effort is always to hold on to the specificity without the quality of asymmetrical power relations, yeah. which is the kind of the struggle in some ways. Um, I think we have time for like one question, <laughs> if there is one. Oh, great, yes, thank you. Did someone say pseudo-craft? I think I, I that That's a great did. term, yeah. I don't remember. Did, did I say I thought you did. Maybe you did. I should have. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, <laughs> I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. I'd love to expand on a term I don't remember using. Um, <laughs> does anyone like the word pseudocraft? Do you want to do a show, anyone? Is it, it probably had something to do with the idea of like an amateur approach to, to using materials that you're not, you're not coming out of that medium-specific world with any particular 
yeah. and, like skill mastery. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, Angelique, anything on pseudo? That seems like an Angelique <laughs> title to me somehow. <laughs> um, would, would that be thinking of someone who is all of a sudden working in a craft-based practice, but like doesn't necessarily have the training in it. Uh, sure, I, I think that happens often. I think we are in a space where, uh, especially younger artists are really in the experimentation phase, they're really more willing to try materials that they haven't in the past and that um, are more technically challenging, I would say. There's a lot that, it, it takes a lot to make ceramics, even though there's a lot of ceramics that don't look like it takes a lot. Um, but uh, even if it's pseudo in the way that somebody's sort of new or amateur to it, I think there's still a lot of validity to choosing to work with that medium. And at the end of the day, we'll see what's successful or not, right? Like if, if yeah. they stick to, with it and it works for them or not and well, they decide I, to go back to a different medium. I think the fact that there is a word like pseudo-craft actually um, makes craft much more valuable because if craft was derogatory and now we have pseudo-craft, which is derogatory, <laughs> well, that means that craft is not derogatory anymore. So I think that's... Uh, maybe we should use that more to, to raise the standard of craft. All right, I'm going to take all of this as a recommendation to have a panel called pseudo-craft next year. <laughs> So come on back next December. I mean, thanking our fantastic panel. So great to have you on Thank you.